Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, state revenue collections are coming in a lot lower than anticipated, and that has Oklahoma lawmakers looking where to cut. We've got a long haul ahead of us, but we've known that for months. This week, we begin a series of reports on how tighter budgets could mean fewer state services. We basically have pitted core functions of government against each other. And in our closer look, I sit down with State Treasurer Ken Miller, who says the way we've been funding state government is just not sustainable. We've reached the point uh, where tax cuts that are not revenue neutral uh, can no longer happen. And after that healthy dose of reality, we're gonna change directions. No, not cat videos, but we will get all cute and furry. So stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech. A job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Rob McClendon. Well, if you are on a New Year's diet, don't feel alone. So state government. Lawmakers are looking for ways to save money to plug a budget hole that looks to be more than $900 million. And that belt tightening may pinch a little or a lot depending upon who you are. Today, we begin an ongoing look at the impact budget woes at the state capitol could have on state services. Here's our Blaine Singletary. You don't have to follow state news very long to realize Oklahoma's budget hasn't been in the best of sorts lately. And as many of us welcomed in the new calendar year and celebrated the holidays, things got even worse. On December 23rd, Oklahoma Finance Secretary Preston Dorflinger declared a revenue failure. This means tax collections to the General Revenue Fund have fallen well below their original estimates. In this case, 7.7% short. Almost every major tax ca category is in decline because of our biggest industry is in decline. And that's bad news for anyone who gets monthly allocations from that fund, especially government agencies. Beginning in January, each agency that receives monthly general revenue allocations will see a reduction of those allocations. State agencies have been dealing with funding cuts for years, and this only stretches the lines thinner, with an additional 176.9 million in cuts across the board. And that could be an even larger number when the legislature convenes. I think it's likely the legislature will do something along those lines, because frankly, I see the situation worsening by the time they're back in February. Dorflinger has set the base cut rate at 3%, but because this cut is proportional to the total amount of money an agency receives, some agencies will be affected more than others. Agencies like the Department of Juvenile Affairs, who are fully funded by the GRF, will take out the full 3%, while others who don't get any funding from it, like the Department of Environmental Quality, will not see a change to their bottom line. So, how did we get here? Make no mistake. The vast majority of the challenge we face ahead of us started at the OPEC building in Saudi Arabia, not at this building located at 2300 North Lincoln. Obviously the oil price isn't getting better and energy companies aren't going to be able to keep employment levels steady under this price. In a state economy with a huge energy sector, if the rigs go down, so do most of the economic numbers. But Representative Scott Inman, Democratic minority leader, disagrees and says the problems do lie within the legislative chambers. When you look at the actual numbers and the fact that our economy is growing, the state's doing relatively well, but yet we have fewer to spend in actual budgetary items, it has to, to lead to only one conclusion, and that's that the, the legislative leadership of the Capitol has sort of let the state down. Their fiscal mismanagement of the budget has caused us to be in a situation with economic growth, but yet budget cuts at the same time. Taking a fundamental approach, Inman points to the numerous tax credits on the books as extra money the state could be adding to its coffers. Money the state needs more every day. What you've seen, though, over the last several years is, is, is we basically have pitted 
core functions of government against each other. As they've layered on tax cuts and tax credits and budget numbers have reduced, instead of saying, you know what, we can have both, we can have good schools and good roads, you now created a situation where roads and schools are fighting each other over the last crumbs of a fiscal budget. That shouldn't happen in Oklahoma. We need both to move the state forward. A treacherous road lies ahead for the state government, but Oklahoma has been through worse. This is the fifth revenue failure since 2000, and Preston Dorflinger says today's is by no means the deepest one. In 2009, revenues were 17.9% off the estimate when revenue failure was declared. The cuts to agencies were 7.5% across the board. It certainly isn't easy, but it won't be as hard as it was the last time, at least not right now. The reality of this situation is that budget shortfalls are nothing new. And with no clear end in sight, lawmakers and state agencies have few choices but to adapt to this economic climate. We've got a long haul ahead of us, but we've known that for months. That's why we've been meeting about it for months. We need to look at all those structural budget challenges we've been talking about, and we need to move from talk to action. Well, one suggestion to help fill the budget gap is for the state to allow some state agencies to operate without appropriations from the state. Jonathan Small is the president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs and says it makes sense for agencies that generate their own revenue to pay their own way. The public policy group estimates this could save up to $20 million a year. Now, in his first term as insurance commissioner, John Doak pushed for his department to do just that but fears by the legislature that they could lose control over a non-appropriated agency killed that proposal. Well, Oklahoma is certainly not alone when it comes to volatile revenue streams. Economic forecasting is a tricky business, especially for states whose economies are dependent on cyclical industries like energy. Now, if you'd like to learn more about how we got ourselves in such a pickle, I have a link to a very interesting article out of the Washington Post that explains it quite well. Just go to our website at OKHorizon.com and look under this story. Now when we return, we'll visit with Oklahoma's state treasurer who has some very definitive ideas on not only how we got here, but how we can get out. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Well, shrinking oil and natural gas prices last year forced Oklahoma companies to cut more than 11,000 jobs and slash oil field spending, a downturn in the energy sector that's reverberating throughout Oklahoma's economy. And while no energy state is immune to global economic shifts, Oklahoma's state government has been particularly vulnerable because of recent efforts to slash taxes. As of January 1, Oklahoma's top income tax rate fell a quarter of a point from 5.25 to a flat 5%. But don't expect a big financial windfall come tax time. Households earning the state's median income of $45,000 will save less than $29 over the course of the entire year. While even the wealthiest of Oklahoma households with incomes of over $1 million will save just about $2,000. But when you add all that up, according to the Oklahoma Tax Commission, the tax cut will cost the state $147 million in lost revenue. Now, in past years, lawmakers have been plugging smaller budget holes by looking under every seat cushion for one-time monies. But this year, the hole's just too big, and we're out of couches which has prompted State Treasurer Ken Miller to speak out over the way his fellow Republicans are funding state government. And I was able to sit down with him after he spoke at this year's Economic Outlook Conference. Do we have a looming structural crisis in the way we approach our state budget? I'm not going to call it a crisis, but I do think that we have structural problems uh, with our budget that can be addressed. Uh, I don't think that they can be addressed in this upcoming session because I think that we're going to have too big of a, a budget hole and so um, that will be reserved for a better economic situation than we have uh, today. But no, I think we're, we're short of a crisis. But um, 
we do need to have increased recognition of that structural problem so that we can correct it uh, down the road with a multi-year process. We did that with pensions, uh, with greater recognition of the pension problem. Uh, the legislature recognized that, they took steps to correct it, and now we're on a, a, a better pathway with our pensions than we were. The same can be done with um, the one-time use of funds or the non-recurring revenue problem that we have, um, but I wouldn't call it a crisis at this point. So how did we get here? Well, uh, you know, I think we got here because, you know, we were using some suboptimal uh, financial practices during the Great Recession. And I think during a time of extreme fiscal distress that that is appropriate. You do things uh, to make the budget work any way that you can. Uh, I was the budget chairman in the House during the Great Recession. Uh, we did things that we would not have, we would have preferred not to do, um, like using revolving fund money, you, using uh, federal dollars. Uh, cutting agencies, yes, and, and all sorts of things that we would have rather not done, but we had to make the budget balance because constitutionally that's not an option. Uh, the problem is those suboptimal practices continued during the economic expansion that followed. And so we've become, on, become dependent on using these suboptimal practices, using this non-recurring revenue source uh, during times of good economic situations and during times of bad economic situations. For a government that's led across the board by elected conservatives, what you're describing really doesn't sound that conservative. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I don't care who you are, right? Uh, and so you, you can't continue uh, to uh, reduce recurring revenues and increase expenditures. Eventually, uh, that's going to cause a structural problem, and I think that's where we're heading. I want to read you a quote from your November newsletter in the commentary, and it's, it's fairly simple. Common sense dictates that until the state proves it can live within its means, meaning its revenues and taxes, it really should stop reducing them. Have we cut taxes enough? Well, we've cut taxes enough unless it's going to be revenue neutral. Again, it goes back to you can't have your cake and, you, and eat it too. You can't continue to cut uh, your recurring revenues, which the income tax is a source of recurring revenues. In fact, it's the largest source of recurring revenues for the state. You can't continue to cut that unless you're willing to cut spending along with it or you're willing to cut business incentives along with it. Uh, so we've reached the point uh, where tax cuts that are not revenue neutral uh, can no longer happen, in my judgment. Mm -hmm. Now, trying to generate new money, there is the one cent sales tax that's being proposed and looks possibly to go in front of a vote of the people. Uh, reflect on that and reflect on, on, I think everyone that we listen to today says that education may well be being starved of money and the future of our state may be well being starved of money right now. Yeah, clearly, I think that education needs to be funded better in Oklahoma. I don't think it's the only thing that needs to be funded better in Oklahoma. In fact, I think if you look at our comparisons with other states on all of the core functions of government, uh, that we could do a better job in funding those. But clearly, education, I'm an educator, so I think it's critical for our, our state's success. We need to fund it better. I think the proposal, uh, the one cent sales tax, uh, reflects the desire from many uh, to find a recurring revenue source to fund teacher pay raises. We've had proposals from uh, this group or another group that's finding ways uh, to find money under the couch cushion to fund a teacher pay raise, but it's like for one year or two years, and that's not gonna work long term. You have to have a recurring revenue source to fund uh, recurring expenditures, which is what we have to have to have a structurally balanced budget going forward. So I think that proposal is just born of frustration from uh, a lot of folks uh, saying that we need to fund teacher pay raises, but never coming up with a real mechanism to do that. So I think this uh, proposal uh, will be judged on its merits. Uh, you know, though the cost of uh, imposing that one cent uh, increase in the sales tax out, out weigh the, the benefit, or though the benefit outweigh the cost, the voters will decide that. Uh, but I certainly understand the desire to have a recurring source to fund teacher pay raises. How do we fix it then? How do we fix what looks to be, whether it be a crisis or not, a structural problem? 
Well, uh, again, I think once there's uh, awareness, increased recognition of the structural problem, and I think that that awareness is starting to catch on. Uh, I think more and more people are understanding that we can't continue uh, to use one-time sources like unclaimed property money and revolving fund balances and uh, this, that, and the other to fund ongoing expenditures. So I think the recognition is getting there uh, with programs like this. The recognition will continue to take place not just in the legislature, but with our, our people uh, uh, out in normal, everyday uh, Oklahoma will we'll be aware of the problem and communicate that to their representatives and senators and uh, those of us that work on their behalf at the state capitol. So awareness is always the first step, right? And I think the awareness is, is getting there. And so then after the economy gets back on sound footing, after we um, get past this soft patch and the oil patch, then I think that we can get a multi-year approach to weaning ourselves off of the one-time use where recurring revenues match recurring expenditures. I think it will happen. It's just a matter of time. Is this an example of conservative ideology running smack dab into economic realities? Well, I can tell you I, when I was first elected, uh, I was much more ideological than I am today. And being the budget chairman helped uh, give me a dose of reality. Uh, and so uh, ideology is, is all good and fine, but the rubber meets the road with reality when you have to fund these core services on which our people depend. And so, um, you know, I think, um, you know, whether it's you, you want to talk in philosophical terms or ideological terms, uh, at the end of the day, what really matters is the dollars and cents. Do you have uh, enough recurring uh, funding to match your recurring expenditures? Um, I think uh, by the very fact that the legislature is augmenting the budget with three to four hundred million dollars of alternative source of revenue, uh, on top of the certified amount, that is de facto admittance that they don't believe there's enough revenue to fund the amount of government services that they desire to fund. And so we have to just get back uh, and um, lay aside um, politics uh, and just focus on policy and make sure that we have the amount of revenues to fund the core government services that our private sector uh, depends on. Yeah, does that mean being just intellectually honest with voters and saying this is how much money we have, these are the choices that we've made, and this is what we have to live within? You know, I, I think being intellectually honest with the voters helps very much. Uh, because the voters will my, make the right decision if they have the information. And I think sometimes we don't provide the right information to voters because we're either being silent uh, about some ridiculous proposals that are floated out there by, by folks who get a lot of attention for those, uh, or through our rhetoric, frankly. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes uh, our rhetoric can be irresponsible when we know better. Uh, and, I, and I think that uh, telling people that uh, you can always lower taxes and great things will happen every single time you do that is not being intellectually honest. Um, you know, there is a certain amount of, of, of revenues that are required to fund education, to fund uh, public safety, to fund transportation infrastructure, and to fund public health. Those things are necessary, uh, and not necessary because uh, we're just trying uh, to be uh, good people and, and, and fund government services, but the pri private sector is dependent on the public sector's foundation to provide a quality workforce, to provide uh, health, pr provide infra uh, infrastructure, and to provide public safety. Those things are absolutely critical to the private sector's success, and government plays a role in that. And so uh, we just have to get real about what it is that government needs to provide to support the private sector and make sure that we have the revenues to do that. Treasurer Miller, thank you for your insights. Thank you. So how do we find ourselves moving ahead with a tax cut in the midst of a revenue failure and a projected $900 million shortfall? Well, the technical answer comes from David Blatt at Oklahoma's Policy Institute. In 2014, the legislature approved Senate Bill 1246 that tied future tax cuts to a revenue trigger. Specifically, the bill stated that the tax cut would be triggered if, as of last December, fiscal year 2016 revenues were expected to be higher than the estimated revenues for 2014. As can be seen from this graph, 12 months ago it appeared that revenues would in fact grow slightly this year, so the trigger mechanism kicked in. But by February, it was clear that this year's revenues would in fact be lower than the previous years. 
But because Senate Bill 1246 wasn't written to respond to changing circumstances, we find ourselves with less revenue and a growing deficit. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, some folks may be a little bit warmer this winter thanks to some hard work this summer. Joining me now is our Courtney May. In Arcadia, Oklahoma, Timberlake Farms is home to almost 60 alpacas. Each animal can produce between 50 and 90 ounces of fleece per year. And at $10 an ounce, these woolly critters are worth their weight in gold. It's shearing time in Oklahoma for alpacas. Steve Hole raises alpacas at Timberlake Farms and says they are a growing part of Oklahoma agriculture. Well, alpacas are a relatively new livestock that has been in the country for about 25 or 30 years. They're an alternative to cashmere, but unlike cashmere, which is very difficult to get, this is a sustainable crop where we get a harvesting of fleece every single year. Alpacas are very robust, very strong, very gentle animals to people, and just are very easy to raise on small acreage. Steve raises alpacas as breeding stock, and also for their fiber. So there are two types of fiber. There's the wakaya fiber, and those are the animals that are kind of the fuzzy wuzzy teddy bear look. And then there are the surrey. The surrey are the ones with the like the dreadlocks. And the surrey can be used because it's a straight fiber as a silk equivalent, whereas the more fluffy, crimpy fiber that's on the wakaya is used for sweaters and things like that, where you want to have what we call loft. So it just depends where you're going in terms of making things. And alpaca fiber is a little easier on the skin than wool. Well, alpaca has a very interesting quality. It doesn't itch. Um, most of us remember very well wool pants as a kid and having to put on a wool sweater and feeling that itch around our neck. Alpaca does not have that itch, so that that's one of the advantages of alpaca. When it's wet, it doesn't have that infamous wool smell, but it does, like sheep wool, does stay warm when it's wet. So it's actually quite a versatile fiber. It's also very strong. Hot as Oklahoma summers are, Steve says the alpacas need shearing before the heat sets in. Alpacas do not shed. They are a domesticated animal, and even back hundreds and hundreds of years ago in South America, these animals had to be shorn. They used sharp obsidian knives to shear them. But today, we shear once a year in Oklahoma. We try to shear before it gets too hot because we need to get that thick winter fleece off them so they can do well in the summer here. Kate Simpson is a large animal vet. She says shear day is time to examine the animals. Yeah, it's a lot like a spa day, but we're, we're really not doing any uh, nail painting here today. <laughs> they're getting sheared, but they're also getting their teeth looked at um, and trimmed down if needed. Um, they're getting their feet looked at and trimmed if needed. Several of them need it. It's good to do that periodically, just like for health and maintenance. And then they're also getting kind of a quick all-over check once the fiber comes off. Steve and other local producers are part of an alpaca cooperative. As alpaca owners, we're sending our fiber to the Alpaca Fiber Co-op of North America, or AFCNA, which then takes our fiber and makes it into finished goods, such as hats and socks and mittens and sweaters and things like that. Janice Robinson is part of the co-op, and she takes the yarn produced from their fleece and creates beautiful, handcrafted clothing. It's a green product, it's a self-sustaining product. The fiber business well supports the monies that we spend in feed for our animals. So it keeps going, you know, it takes care of itself. And this value-added product looks to connect personally with its customers. What I do on my yarns is I always have a picture of the alpaca and my husband and I say that it's fiber with a face. It's uh, you see the alpaca, and you want to be able to, oh, I want Fiona's yarn, or I, you know, that's what I do here, is you have a picture of the animal that you actually, the yarn's made from. Putting a face on a craft made from an exotic animal right here in Oklahoma.
This fleece is considered to be higher quality than sheep wool, and in the 1700s, alpaca fleece was used to make clothing for the royalty and was referred to as the fiber of the gods. That's pretty highfalutin. So are these high status items then? Well, you can buy reasonably priced items made from alpaca fleece, and you can also buy high-end items. Mm -hmm. In fact, world-famous designer Giorgio Armani uses alpaca fleece to make his specialty suits that are worn by many celebrities. Well, I do have an alpaca sweater, but I'm pretty sure it's not an Armani. Thank you so much, Courtney. You're welcome, Rob. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the value of education. The day when a lot of us could go do routine jobs in a blue collar or white collar uh, office space is, is gone. And so we're all having to upskill pretty rapidly just to keep pace with our, our modern economy. And we'll examine a controversial proposal to increase teacher pay by cutting other teachers' pay. Education at a Crossroads, a local show for the heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here next week. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's Career Tech provides nationally recognized technical education. Career Tech elevates the economy, helping Oklahomans get great jobs. Career Tech connects thousands of qualified graduates with thriving Oklahoma businesses. Career Tech also gives Oklahoma companies training and services that help them become even more profitable. Oklahoma's Career Tech a job for every Oklahoman, and a workforce for every company. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry.